Okay. Boker Tov, good morning, everyone. We are so excited to welcome you to Nicole Bakes French Macarons. Right. <laughs> we are very excited to have Nicole here. We are very excited to have Nicole's daughters here with us today. Um, and we welcome all of you. So take it away, Nicole. Hi, guys. Um, today we're going to make French macarons. And don't worry, it's not going It's not going to come easy the first time. It's going to be probably three or four times before you start to really nail it. So don't beat yourself up. Sorry, there's a knuckle in the way. My husband's <laughs> trying to figure it out so I can see everybody. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Perfect. So um, it'll take you a little bit of time. Just have patience with yourself because it's really not the easiest thing to do. Um, again, a lot with French, French pastry, it's a lot of visual cues, and until you really get comfortable with them, it takes a little bit. So, very first thing you need to do is turn your oven on, always. I'm going to turn it on to 200. Uh, generally, when you are working um, with French macarons, you let them sit out for about an hour to develop a skin, but there's a second way to do it, which for those of us who have lives, um, it works a lot easier. You just put your oven on a low temperature, 200 degrees, and you're going to set them in there for 15 minutes once they're piped to dry out the shell. It doesn't give you, you know, an amazing rise, you know, as opposed to like letting it do it naturally, but I think it's a pretty good substitute. So I'm going to go ahead and start it up. Nicole, okay. Yes. In our, in our directions that we will be receiving. Will they give us both options? I can. Um, I just, I find that um, I'll do it for you. That's not a problem. I just find that this way, it just saves you a little bit of time. Because like I said, we're all really, really busy. Um, and the meringue, with, sorry, the meringue version we're going to do is a little bit different too. So it's, it's definitely more geared towards the beginner working with meringue. So yeah, that'll nice. be really nice. Yeah. So I'm just going to go over um, the ingredients you need to have. So you should have your egg whites and they should be at room temperature or you can do what's called aging your egg whites. That means you leave them in your refrigerator for four days and I know they're fine. Trust me, just put a little cellophane over it and poke some holes and um, then they'll be fine. But room temperature is just perfect. Then you have your sugar, your cream of tartar, and you're going to have a pinch of salt. And that's going to be the meringue base. And then what you're going to need for the actual macaron is your almond flour. You're going to need your powdered sugar. Can you use regular flour? It has to be almond flour. Okay. Um, regular flour does not work. You can use other nut flours. This really truly isn't if you have nut allergies, you, you really, this isn't a recipe for you. Um, but nut flours are what works best. Walnut flour, um, pistachio flour, um, almond flour are the best ones for macarons. Um, you have your zest of one lemon and two tablespoons of poppy seeds. And then you should have your food coloring. So you can use either liquid food coloring, gel food coloring, or powdered food coloring. Um, I'm using powdered food coloring, um, which you can see in there. When you're using powdered food coloring, you want to make sure you actually put it in as we're um, grinding up the mix uh, because it's, it's very saturated and it will stain you. So you have to be very careful with that. Um, and then for the tools, if you have a KitchenAid um, thing, what do you call these things? One of these things. Food processor. Food processor thank you. My brain is not working today. So if you have a food processor, that's really, really helpful. You also need a sifter or a, a colander that has fine mesh, your pastry bags, and a couple of spatulas and scissors. And that is all you need besides your mixer, which is important. Um, so when we're going to make the meringue, which will be the very first step we do after we grind our flour up, I need you to make sure that your bowl is really, really clean. The, bowl, the egg of the meringues will not rise if there's any oil in the bowl or on um, the actual uh, whisk. One of the ways that you can ensure that that doesn't happen is use a lemon and just run over all of your um, equipment with an actual lemon. And that acid 
will take care of the um, any oils that are left in and then just wipe it out. So that's all you have to do if you're not 100% certain. And then your bowl is nice and clean and shiny. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do is process our flour and our um, powdered sugar. And for that, you will need to use your food processor on the pulse option. So go ahead and you're going to put your almond flour around, and then you're going to put your powdered sugar around. Lock that, make sure you lock it. We're going to pulse it four times, three seconds each. If it wants to work. <laughs> there it goes, okay. After the second one, I take a whisk and I just kind of go around just to make sure that I, I'm getting it down the sides. Okay, that should be it. So what we're doing right now is we're incorporating it and we're trying to get it into a nice fine powder, which adds to your shine um, and keeps a nice skin on the actual uh, cookie itself. And now where do you buy almond powder, almond flour? Almond flour, you can pretty much find at any grocery store in the flour section. Um, I buy mine at uh, Costco in a large bag. It's like $19.99 for the bag itself, um, as opposed to like $10 for a small bag at the grocery store. So I just find it's a little more cost effective to buy it in bulk. Um, but you can even find it at Outpost. You can find it just about anywhere. I and just yeah. found it this morning at Pick and Save. Yes, Ooh, they have it there. It was $8 for the small bag. So this is what the one at Costco will look like. Mm. Cool. Yeah, and this this one here is three pounds for nineteen dollars. Wow. Yeah, so it is. A, it's a much better deal if you do it that way. Okay, so now that we have our flour and confectioner, and sugar first. thank you, Sandy. Look at you. Yeah. So this is Bob's what I red like. milk. But this said super fine. Is that going to be that's, okay? No, that's perfect. That's what you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they generally are ground to be pretty fine, but yeah, anything you can get this as super fine and baking, it's always a good thing. Okay. Okay, so now the next thing we're going to do is you're going to take your colander or sifter and we're going to sift out the lumps because inevitably the powdered sugar will be stuck in the bottom. <laughs> it always is. So we're just going to go ahead and sift this through after I get the powdered sugar out. And just sip that onto your extra piece of parchment. And they'll always be like these fine little lumps. That's okay, you don't need them. You can just go ahead and get rid of them. You don't need to push it through. Okay, so now our flour is all set. We're going to set it aside. We're gonna work on our meringue now. Okay, so for our meringue, we're going to Put our sugar right in the bowl. Can I call you back? I'm feeling better. Okay. We're going to put a pinch of salt in. Just a little pinch. And go ahead and put your four egg whites right in the bowl. I know it's really, really unconventional to do it this way. <laughs> if someone has, is on a low sodium diet, Mm -hmm. Do I need to do the pinch of salt? No, you can take the pinch out. What it does just the helps. pinch of salt do? Yeah, the batch that I had done previously, because I like to experiment a little bit, I really don't see a huge notice. It just helps with the cell structure. That's really all it does. The, I'm sorry, the protein structure. And then 
We're going to add um, half a teaspoon of cream of tartar after we start to see some small, like little, like soft peaks. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead, I'm, I kept my mixer back there just because what happens is that um, the sound deadens because as soon as it hears noise, the whole thing shuts down. So you won't be able to hear me talk. You may or may not, but hopefully you can. I'll be a little bit closer to the actual camera then. Let me just pop this on real quick. And we're gonna put it on medium speed until the peaks are um, so it's like shiny and glossy and has stiff peaks. Uh, it takes about 11 minutes depending on the speed of your mixer, but then again, you just have to really pay attention um, to what you're doing. You can walk away with this. It is kind of hard to over whip these doing it this method. So I have it on speed five. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. So? Okay. Okay. So as soon as I have soft peaks, I'm going to add half a teaspoon of my cream of tartar. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add, pump it right in. That's it. Now we're just going to let it go until we have the piece. So this is the exciting part, guys. I'm just going to stand here and look at me. <laughs> Would you like me to do my taste of Judaism, my dash of Judaism while we're waiting? Absolutely, go for it. Okay, let me spotlight me. Hello. So I wanted to share with you the neat thing. It was a great question about whether you could use regular flour because since we specifically learned it had to be an almond or some kind of nut flour, you have now learned that all macaroons and macarons are all kosher for Passover because there's no regular flour in it. So I wanted to share with you a little history. Of why do we eat coconut macaroons? And then a little bit about other traditions and macaroons and amaretti cookies, etc. So a macaroon whether it's a French macaron sandwich, an Italian amaretti cookie, or a chocolate dip coconut macaron, they're all based in that egg white and sugar, which gets mixed with almond paste, almonds, pistachios, whatever, or shredded coconuts. And until coconut became available to Europe and American bakers in the late 1800s, macaroons were nut based. The almond macaroon was first made in Sicily. And then through the trade with Tunisia, who captured Sicily in 827. By the 13th century, Sicily was famous for the center of pasta and almond paste and rose water sweets like marzipan and macaroons. The Italian macaroons caught on, especially in the Italian Jewish community, who savored these flourless treats during Passover. To this day, Sephardic Jews from Syria and Egypt make theirs without coconut using brown pistachios, almonds, and cashews. And when they got switched to the United States, it in came the coconut. So here's what happened. Franklin Baker, who was a Philadelphia flour miller, discovered that coconut could be a great baking ingredient because hello, credit and it made it more affordable and shelf stable than shipping an entire coconut. As predicted, pastry chefs and home cooks soon fell in love with shredded, shredded coconut. It didn't spoil, 
They were sturdy, they were shippable, all was good. The coconut macaroon were immediately swept up into the new marketing campaigns begun by kosher companies in the late 1800s. As Leah Koning writes, kosher for Passover chocolates, matzo ball mixes, and coconut macaroons were made on a large scale and marketed to Jewish families during the holidays. And there became the macaroon tins and boxes that we recognize today. Now, what other ones are eaten? Well, here we go. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of different ones that can be used. Um, besides just the beautiful ones that we are making today and all the yummy flavors that came from that. We also have obviously the coconut haystack macaroon. And then there are some other traditions of different things that have been added. Some people taste, um, put their, put marshmallow in it. Some people add maple syrup or pecan or hibiscus or guava or bourbon or salted caramel. There's like tons of different kinds. And there's traditions of different areas adding different things. So in, um, India, they eat the mangalore, which is a cashew-based macaron. Mm. We've already talked about the amaretti, which is Italian. Um, and then there also is there also are some that add honey into it, and some have it where the coconut is chewy, and some have it where the coconut is more like velvety, like a mounds bar. But all of them are good things. There's even one um, that actually has rose water and um, marzipan in it. So people have been playing with it in all different kinds of ways. And I personally make one with pistachios. Um, I don't make, I don't get pistachio flour. I actually ground my own pistachios myself when I make it and it's quite delicious. So thank you, and back to you. I'm going to now switch the spotlight back to Nicole. Here we go. There we go. Thank you, that was so cool. I love learning new stuff. Let's, um, I'm just gonna take a peek real quick. Let's take a look at this and see where we're at. See, it's almost there, it's kind of, but you see, it's getting really, really shiny. I don't know if you can see it. You can't see it. I try. But we're almost there. So I'm just going to let it go a couple more minutes. And then we're just going to go ahead and start mixing everything up. Nicole? Yes. Um, how long did you say to beat that 10 minutes? It can go anywhere from, depending on the, 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 the mixer you have, 11 minutes I think is a really good average time. Um, mine is a little, you know, a little quicker than some people's, so um, mine took about eight minutes. Sure. And, and then if it does this and doesn't fall out, you did it right. And then you said on about speed five, why not higher? Because usually they say for egg whites to go higher to like, near the end on a KitchenAid. Okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, eggs, in order for meringue to be stable, it has to develop cell walls. So like, think of a building, how, um, there's always a flagstone and then they build on those stones. So if you whip really, really, really fast right away, you're creating huge air pockets or air bubbles. Mm. Those aren't stable. So what we wanna do is start it slow and create small little cells, air cells essentially, that can support the meringue as it gets larger and larger. So that's why you go slow. Initially, when I'm making my own meringue or even whipped cream, I start it on like three until it gets foamy, and then I'll take it up to five, and then I'll whip that up until it's the right consistency. 
And then right before I'm about ready to serve it or pull it off, I'll jack it up to a high speed just to like get that height and everything that I want in it. So that's why you oh. start low and build up. Thank you. So You're welcome. Good to know. Would it benefit us to start even below five for the meringue? You absolutely can. That's not a problem. I would say if you're going to do that, start it at a three until it gets foamy. And then if it's foamy at that point, go ahead and add your cream of tartar and then go ahead and pull it up to the five. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, that totally is fine. Um, so this is the consistency. You can kind of see it's nice and shiny. And you see how it's kind of holding those peaks that I put in there. Almost looks like marshmallows and that's what you want. So what we're going to do now, the sifted flour that you have made or that you had done, we're going to pour some of that in, about a third. And then you're going to take your spatula and you're going to start folding that in. And your arm is going to get a workout. <laughs> Everybody knows the folding method, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us yeah. just in case? So the folding method, what you're doing is you're going against the bowl. You're going to scrape around and cut down through the middle. So the whole time you're scraping and cutting. So scrape, cut, scrape, cut. Okay, so I'm gonna add the rest of my flour now. So what we want to do is we want to get this to about 90% mix, which is, you know, ha, 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 funny, funny, because you don't know what you're looking for. You'll kind of sense it, it starts to come together. And when it starts to come together, that's when you're going to want to add your food coloring and your um, poppy seeds, if you're doing poppy seeds, or just your lemon zest or your lemon zest and poppy seeds, whichever way you're doing it. See, it's starting to come together now. Now, I thought you had already added food coloring. I did. In mine, I added food coloring. I did powdered food coloring. Uh, but yeah. at this point in time, oh. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> at this point in time, you can add, um, if you're doing liquid, add six drops. If you're doing gel, add five drops. Right directly in. I thought you, yeah, that's what I thought. You put the food coloring in first. You put only if it's powder. If you no, have you, powder you did, I saw you do it. Yes, because she's using powder. Because she's using powder, correct. Yeah. I got it. The reason why I like to use powder is because I personally don't like to add more liquid to my recipes if I don't have to. And the colors are more intense. Uh, so now this is where you would add your liquid or gel if that's what you're using, and your poppy seeds and your lemon zest. And get that all in there. And you will have poppy seeds. You'll be finding poppy seeds for a while. <laughs> they get everywhere. Okay, so now we're going to continue to fold at this point in time. Just keep going. And I know most people are afraid they're going to knock the air out. With these, you will be knocking some of the air out, and that's fine. That's part of... Um, that's part of the macaron that you're working on. Um, you don't want too much air because otherwise you get a real hollow shell with air holes. You don't want that. Okay. And we're gonna keep going until we get what's called a drop test. And so the drop test is like when you hold it and you drop it and it melts back in. We're not there yet. Um, we're getting close. So we just keep going until it just kind of melts together. It's nice and shiny and pretty. Like I said, your arm will get a little tired. This is why it's helpful to, <laughs> you can take a break, it's fine. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. We're getting close. Yeah, so I'll have him show you. So, see how it's dropping in and it's sort of melting in a little bit? 
we want it to melt in a little bit more than that. So we're gonna mm. let it go just good. We're gonna mix it just a little bit more. Okay, let's see. Yep, now it's doing it. Okay. Okay. So it's just kind of, it's starting to just kind of all run in together now when it drops. And that's the stage you want it. Okay, so that's good. Okay, so now we are going to load our piping bags. Wash my hands real quick. So did you, you didn't discuss the history of the French macaron, did you? I did not. Okay, so I'll go over a little bit of the history of the French macaron. Um, it's believed that, um, I think I wrote it down real quick, sure, sure. So it's believed that Catherine de Medici, she brought it over to France when she got married um, to King Henry II in 15, what's 1533. But that's just theory. It actually was around way before then and it came from the Venetians. And, um, but the monasteries in Venice were making them in about the eighth century. And um, there's another theory that a French abbey was making them in the south of France. And let's see, it was during um, 791, they were called the, um, the Serre Macaron. So they were making, these nuns were making these macarons to help support their, well, keep their, their habit going. Um, so by doing that, they made these little cookies and these little cookies are egg whites and almond flour and sugar. And they didn't look like today's macarons at all. It wasn't until about, I think it was like the Edwardian era. So about 1862 is when you started to see actual French macarons, the way they look, come in to fashion in Paris and they were brought at this little tea shop. This little tea shop came up with this idea of sandwiching two macarons together and putting ganache in the center. And so that's there. So like the Edwardian era, that's when they really came into fashion in Paris. And um, they're always in fashion here too. So just, I'm a geek. I like to know just the little things. But it's yeah. really interesting. As I've traveled in Europe, especially in Italy and Spain, um, many of the nunneries still sell the little cookies and you can't even see them because they're supposed to stay separate from the world. So you put in your money, you yeah. turn a thing around. I mean, talk about social distancing, right? <laughs> then they put it, they put it, your cookies in and they rotate it around to you and you don't even see them, it's behind the walls and everything, and then it comes out. Um, it's sort of like, um, are you doing this? I guess a vending machine. Thank you. version of a vending machine. Yeah, and some like actual like pastry shops sell them in these like, like Ren, um, a few other little French towns. Um, and they sell them on these like little cardboards. They just like bake them right on these cardboard, like, and they like tear offs, and then they, Sell them being on these little cardboard tear offs. They're pretty cool. All right, so I have my pastry bag all ready to go. We're going to go ahead and you're going to put about half of your macro. You know what this is called? Um, when you are actually doing that mixing, it's called macaron herb, which is kind of an odd thing, but. <laughs> Like I was macaron erring. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely English language. And once again, if we don't have piping bags, we can just use Ziplocs and cut off the corner? Yes, absolutely. You want the hole and the end to be about um, half an inch. Okay. Okay, so that's about half. Okay, let's it up. I'm going to push it. Okay, I'm going to grab my cookie sheet. 
So have your cookie sheet. Uh, this will do about two and a half, three cookie sheets, depending on the size of macarons you make. Um, so have two to three lined parchments or, or parchment lined or silicone lined cookie sheets. Um, we're going to cut about, like I said, about half an inch. Pull. And this is where Richard is going to flip that around so you can watch me doing this. Okay. So remember how I told you before, um, when working with pastry, it's off is up. Richard, I'm what? trying to show something. Oh, sorry. So off is up, on is down. So mm -hmm. you have to remember to do that when working with anything wet inside a pastry bag. We're going to want to space them about an inch apart. And you're going to put them down at a 45 degree angle. And you're going to squeeze counting one, two, three, four, stop. And you're going to turn clockwise because we're trying to eliminate a tail. About an inch apart, one, two, three, four, stop, twist. Mm. One, two, three, four. It takes time and it takes practice and that one's a little too close. It's going to run together. Um, like I said, it takes me, it's taken me a long time to even just get this basic twist thing down. Okay. And now we're going to do it here. Just kind of filling in that hole. That's it. Yeah, it's just a quick clockwise turn, but you have to be done piping in order for it to work. So you have to just ease the pressure off of your hand, off of the bag, I mean, with your hand. That's the trick. Oh, little tail on that one. Takes a while. This is kind of soothing. I really love to do this and I love watching it being done. <laughs> it's just mesmerizing to me. Um, and now, you see how they're starting to flatten out? And they have this beautiful shine on them. That's what they should look like. Um, that's what I was talking about. You wanna get them to that drop stage so that you barely see any tails. So that's what you're looking for. Now Richard's gonna pull back because this is gonna get really, really loud now. So now we have to pound the pan because what we want to do is get rid of the air bubbles. Yeah, I would back it up just a little bit. There you go. So you're going to take this, we're going to pound it. Turn it around. Huh. Yeah, this is loud, guys. And it's flattening it, but it's also getting the air bubbles out. If you see a little air bubble, just go ahead and just like grab a toothpick and just pop it. That's what you, you just want to get rid of the air bubbles. Okay. Looks like a great thing to do when you're frustrated. It really is. It's, I don't know if you can see it, but oh. like, there are some air bubbles that have like popped through here. That's what you want. Because if you don't do this enough, what winds up happening is it gets its foot, but it stays hollow on the inside of it. And so you don't want that. You want that meringue to rise up right inside of it nicely. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put these in the oven now. Do you need to do something similar to that when you make meringues? No, meringues, you don't wanna pound any air yeah. out. Got it, okay. Okay, so I just put it into the 200 degree oven. So I'm gonna set my timer for 15 minutes and we are drying out the shells now. So this is where you would have it sit for an hour plus? Right, I would say no longer than an hour and it kind of depends on if your house is humid or not. 
It can take up to an hour if the house is humid. If your house is dry, it'll be quicker than an hour. So today, an hour. Today, an hour. <laughs> yeah. And you should be able to touch them. So you would just kind of touch them, poke them very, very gently. Um, and if you feel a skin on them, then they're ready to bake. Got it. Yes. Okay. Could you back up one second? The temperature of the oven. So currently the temperature of the oven is 200 degrees because I'm doing my skin. I'm drying them out to get my skin on them. For and how then, long? For how long? Ahead. This for is going to be 15 minutes for the first one. Okay, and then after you um, bake them for 15 minutes, you're going to whack your oven up to 350 degrees. Oh. And then you're going to bake them for an additional nine minutes. And then, I'm like, I know, I hear people like writing stuff down. Um, <laughs> So uh, bake them an additional nine minutes. And what I would recommend doing is if you, they need to be able to kind of like forcefully, like if you're at the bottom of the macaron where the little, it gets what's called a foot. So that little bubbly part is called a foot. If you can like very gently, but firmly, like with your hands, release it from, then they're done at nine minutes. If they still feel like the top is gonna come off, give them another minute and check. And if it still does it, then give them another minute, but pull them out after that. I would say you really truly don't want your macarons in there longer than 11 minutes. And then after you do that, they should look like this. Richard will come in close mm -hmm. so you can see them. So this is so. after the 15 plus the nine. Yep, this is the 15 plus the nine and these have the foot on them. You can see the foot. Um, what I have found is that this recipe, because of the poppy seeds, some of the weight of the poppy seed really doesn't allow for us to get a nice dome on it. Um, in order to get a nice dome too, it really helps if you have aged egg whites and if you use a little bit what's called um, meringue powder in it. The meringue powder also helps lift them up, but it's not something that a lot of people have access to. Um, but these will still be absolutely delicious. They just don't have that real beautiful dome. Where would one get meringue powder? Um, you can get it on Amazon if you want. Uh, you can sometimes find it in specialty bake stores like Cook's in West Allis will carry it. It'll be called um, meringue powder. It could be called powdered egg whites or albium powder. Those would be the three things that you could look for. Thank you. And how much would you add? You um, a tablespoon to this mixture. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then what you do with this one, if you want to add the powdered egg whites, you're going to, you know, like when you put the sugar in right before making the meringue, um, put the sugar in, put the albium powder in, and then give it a good whisk with a hand whisk real quick, just to incorporate the sugar and the powdered egg white together. And then you would go ahead and add the rest of those ingredients. Super simple. Okay. Okay. So that's what those are going to look like. Um, I'm going to let them go and just keep baking. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you filling these because this is the best part. <laughs> so you all should have gotten your curd recipe. And if you were baking with me, you would have already made your curd. Um, so the curd you're going to want to put also in a baggie like this. And just take that and like flip it down. It doesn't need to be like, you don't need it. There you go, perfect. So kind of play pairs if you want. So just kind of go, oh, that one looks like it goes together, that one, or just do it like this, where it's just every other, because we're going, the ones that I'm turning upside down, we'll put the curd on those. And I'm going to cut my pastry bag in the center. You're just going to squeeze. I'm very, very giving. I like my stuff to ooze out. Makes me happy when it's a messy. 
because curd is just so delicious and everybody loves their lemon curd. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this one is a really nice recipe too because it's nice and tart. Let's keep going. Now what else, can you use this, what else can you use this lemon curd for? You could use it on scones if you want. Um, I'm prone to just taking a big spoon and eating it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. It's so good. Sounds good to me. I know. Um, it's good on toast. It's good on a lot of things. Uh, a filler for the inside of a cake. My children's favorite birthday cake is a chocolate cake with lemon. And yeah, so... So you can use this in the center, you know, put your cake in half and then um, put your like some buttercream around it and then put the curd in the center of that so it doesn't ooze out. Mm. Um, it's so divine, oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, Nicole, did you yeah. use uh, the lemon juice? Was that uh, from the bottle or was it real squeeze it? You can squeeze it, but to make it easy for people, I been using just regular lemon juice because I wanted to see what the difference was and I haven't found any difference. Oh, okay. Because and that, would, that would constitute a lot of lemons. It takes about yeah. 10 lemons. Yeah. And that's just, that's a lot of money. Lemons are expensive right that's now for some reason. So lemon juice I find works just fine. And so pretty the macaron wow yeah Beautiful. they taste so good so, so with good. that being said what you're going to do now when your um, oven beeps and you whack it up to 350 degrees and you check those temperatures oh well, check to make sure the cookie hey there's my kitty <laughs> um, <laughs> you check <laughs> that the macarons are ready, I would say, again, no longer than 11 minutes, you're going to want to turn that oven back down to 200, pop it open, pop open the door for a little bit. Um, after you take your fresh little macarons out of the oven, take it to 200, open the door, let that come back down to 200. Um, as it's coming back down to 200, shut the door when it is, and you'll do the next set and do the exact same thing, just a repeat. Oh. Okay. Because like I said, you'll get two to three trays of these. So yeah, it's and it depends on the large. So I did some not. normal size and I did some big ones. So and also were these com were the the macaroons completely cold when you filled them or were they Yes. Let they them were... get to room temperature. Just let them be at room temperature and okay. um they'll be fine. Like these took by the time you bake all of your macarons, the, the very first batch that you pulled out of the oven will be ready to start after you pull all of them out. Okay. So just make sure that they're nice and cool to the touch. Okay. Yeah. But they're really, they're quite lovely. And then, um, so you'll just cut it in half like that. They're nice and gooey. You see how they're like gooey on the inside and oh, they're so good. I love these. <laughs> they're so good as Bianca's giggling she likes these too. where will well yeah. where will we store them you excellent question that was my next point you want to store these in the freezer mm -hmm. um some like French pastry chefs say at this point in time once they're all done you put them in your refrigerator for 24 hours to mature is what they call it I find myself I like them put directly into the freezer and store them in an airtight container and then pull out only what you want so if you want to serve four cool them in the refrigerator just to get the the frozen off of them so maybe cool them in the refrigerator for 24 hours if you plan on serving them the next day and then um store them in the freezer refr you know defrost in the fridge serve them that's how i would do it mm -hmm. okay Super delicious. You want to pull it up? Oh, sorry. It look good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you have? So it's it it really it is it's time consuming as far as just really getting to understand the process, um, but it's really worth it. I've had a lot of fun because this is something I wasn't really comfortable with initially. So I did a lot of practice runs. Some were successful. <laughs> Richard's <laughs> eating it, <laughs> and he hates macarons. 
So that's what's so cool about this recipe is that everybody I've given this to, they really love this macaron because it tastes like a really tart lemon poppy seed muffin. Yeah. It's so good. And like I said, if you don't like poppy seeds, uh, I really, because I have diverticulitis, I really shouldn't be eating poppy seeds. You can make it with just the lemon zest and take out the lemon or the poppy seeds and they're just as good. Do you find that, um, the, you know, with lemon zest, sometimes it clumps, you know, um, well, hopefully you're giving it a nice mix, like with, when you're stirring or when you're folding it in, it should really break it up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes you really have to kind of break up the clumps. Yes. And it depends too what kind of zester you're using. If you're using like what's called a microplaner, where you yes. get a real fine zest, yes. I, I don't find I have as many clumping issues with that because it doesn't have a lot of surface texture to grab onto. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a planer, but sometimes love it. <laughs> sometimes have to, you know, disperse it a little bit. Yeah, and that's oh, and fine. I mean, I throw stuff in all the time in clumps. If you're working it good enough, it, it'll all break up and incorporate really well. Okay, and the egg whites were room temperature. Room temperature, and if you can age them, you will get a better result. The ones that I did um, this morning were fresh, so. Okay. I, yeah, you, it'll just be a better, it'll be a better product if you let them age in your refrigerator for four days. Really? And after we age yeah. them for four days, do we then put it out at room temperature? Yes. Okay. Interesting. With, with uh, a plastic wrap on top or something like that? or? Yep, exactly. Just put them in a bowl, um, a glass bowl, or whatever cling film will stick bowls. really well. Whatever. You just don't want to use aluminum. No, ever, ever use aluminum with eggs. Um, but, days. pardon me? For four days, okay. For okay. four <laughs> days, yes. And then put the cellophane on the top of it and just take a knife and poke, you know, like four or five holes in it so that the air can get to it. Yes, I understand, I understand. You don't even want to know what they do in France. Like the pastry chefs, they just have like a big, huge thing of egg whites sitting out. <laughs> and they age them that way. But eggs in Europe are different than they are here, so. Sure, sure. Yes, they are. Oh my goodness, okay. Now what happens if I don't remember until I only have three days before I want to make it? Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just say you'll have a better product if you age them. If you don't, like I said, these, these were pulled out this morning and I just brought them to room temperature. But three days of aging is better than no days than no days. Aging. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. But always First do your lemon curd the night before. <laughs> what, the night before? Do your lemon curd the night before. Okay. Just let okay. it set. Um, if you don't like the consistency of the curd and you think it should be a little stiffer, like I put two tablespoons of cornstarch in this, you could probably pull up one more tablespoon. I wouldn't go more than that, though. You'll get a real funny taste. Can you use bought lemon curd or wouldn't it work? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the thing is with French pastry is that there, it's, it's, people make it so difficult. And if you find that you don't have time to make things by hand or by scratch, there's nothing wrong with taking, you know, shortcuts like using the lemon juice. It's, it's, it's fine because truly baking is about the pride and the love that you put into it and what you get out of it. And if, you know, like me using regular lemon juice and made my life easy and I'm really happy, then I'm great. I'm really good with this. Um, and same thing goes with the lemon curd. Some of those store-bought lemon curds are delicious. So yeah, go for it. I actually made the lemon curd last night when we talked mm -hmm. and like it looks perfect it's and good. it took like 20 minutes mm -hmm. and I'm very impressed because it smells really good. Yeah. Lemon, there's this like, m like this complete like misnomer that lemon curd is like some ancient secret that's really difficult to do. It's really easy. Just um, a lot of eggs and butter. It's so good. <laughs> Literally just spoonfuls. That's perfect. That's all you need. <laughs> that's Thank fun. you. They look yeah. delicious. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you. I had fun. I appreciate it. He's going to put it so I can see everybody because I can't see everybody. We I don't like looking at myself. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank oh, you. Look at this. 
Okay, so the skin's done. <laughs> Wait, 350. Let's show them the skin. No, it's fine. Cancel. Uh, timer, nine minutes. All right. I'm going to let these go and I'll fill the rest of mine later. And now that we've seen your cat a couple of times, what is the name of your cat? Her name is Chai. She's a Hi. rescue. She's <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Richard, bring her in here. She is, quite frankly, the love of our life right now. We'll We're just that. so crazy about her. This is Chai. Oh. Hi. Yeah, she's two years old. Um, she's a good girl. Most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Hi, Harry. Yeah. We figure Richard and I can't have our own children, so we'll have a cat. Very <laughs> right, yeah. Bobby? She's she a good girl. Like Harry. <laughs> she looks like the Harry we had. His name was oh, Harry. That's oh, a good no. name for a cat. I love that. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, the bird we don't have out right now. He's upstairs, so. I am Otherwise, he's he's partial to rescue animals. Yes, they're the best. <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you. I'll, I'll type up the methods that I use, and I'll send them over to Susan so she can post them for you. Um, thank you. And by all means, my, you know, my email is in the directory, too. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for thank joining you. us. Bye. So as soon as I get everything <laughs> going up on the CEBJ website on the online learning page. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.